Hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be trying to play some catch up and uh, hopefully recording and posting um, sermons from the past three weeks. Um, and I just fell a bit behind. But uh, when I got back uh, from a, a short vacation at the end of June, I started a new series where we're in the Old Testament and what we like to call the historical books, and I'm um, taking a look at some of the stories of the different characters we find there, um, and just examining, you know, what what do their stories tell us about faith? Whether it's you know how we should be living, or uh, the truths it tells us about God and how God relates to us. Uh, but so our first story today, it's going to come from the book of Ruth, and I'm going to read for you uh, chapter one. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malone and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malone and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is the word of God for the people of God. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was, My God is King. His wife's name was Pleasant, and the names of his two sons were Sickness and Wasting Away. You heard that right. I kid you not, Mr. and Mrs. My God is King named their two sons uh, Sickness and Wasting Away. Right? Truly 
beautiful names. And uh, today we are exploring the story of Sickness's wife, Friendship. Uh, or, or some of her friends prefer to, to, to call her companion. Um, we though typically just call her Ruth. And Ruth's story, it opens with tragedy in chapter one. Her, her dear husband, Sickness, dies. And uh, of who knows what? I don't know, maybe a donkey accident. But, but her story then, it transforms into one of survival in, in chapter two. Uh, she and her mother-in-law, who, who's now choosing to go by the name Bitter, uh, well, well, they need food, desperately. But eventually her story blossoms into a romance novel in chapter 3. Uh, she seduces a nice older gentleman by giving him cold feet, which, you know, admittedly sounds counterproductive. Um, I guess, you know, he just had to be there at some cultural thing. But, 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 but of course you can't have a classic romance story without a healthy dollop of, of lawyering involved in the final chapter. Uh, so quickness, or, or, or Boaz if you prefer, uh, quickness acts... Oh, it's the word. Um, he acts not slow. Uh, quickness acts very not slowly, and, and, and he finds this one unnamed guy who he calls so-and-so, and, and he convinces him to, to pass up his legal right to take Ruth as his wife, and it was a, a sort of a weird legal dib situation from another culture a long time ago, right? Like, such a dibs would not hold up in our courts today. Um, but, but anyway, by the end, Mr. Coldfeet Boaz, he, he actually follows through on his promise to marry Ruth, and the two of them, they, they quickly get busy, and, and out of Ruth pops a baby boy right into the arms of her mother-in-law, who is once again happy to go by the name Pleasant. Now let's pause here and ask an important question. Why did Pleasant name her sons Sickness and Wasting Away? Seriously, j just ask that question and, and then try to answer it for yourself. Why did Pleasant name her sons Sickness and Wasting Away? Okay, now, after giving that some thought, uh, now perhaps we're a bit more ready for this, this next question. Did Pleasant name her sons Sickness and Wasting Away? Right, think about that. Like, would a Pleasant mother really do that to her children? A and if Pleasant did not name them that, who did? And whoever did name them that, why? And with that, uh, it's time we talk about what the biblical authors are up to here. Uh, you, you see, there's something that we need to always keep in mind about the books in this section of our Bibles. We often refer to these as the historical books, because they cover a, a significant portion of the history of Israel following the time of Moses. However, historical is a bit of a misnomer here. You see, when, when we hear, when we today, when we hear historical, we, we tend to think factual. Right? We think we're reading one of our modern textbooks on, on history or social studies but, but you see, these books in our Bibles, they're, they're not written by the same kinds of people. They're not written by scholarly historians who, who do years of research and then finish by going over all of it, going through all of it with a, with a fine-tooth fact-checking comb to make sure each line and date and name is accurate. Right? Like, like, like instead, these books in our Bible, these historical books, well, they're written by prophets, Prophets who were inspired by God to speak God's messages to God's people, and the prophets of these particular books, they chose to use their people's history and stories to share these messages, right? The history and the stories, they're like a medium through which these messages are being shared. And these are going to be messages of, of warning, but also messages of hope. 
right? Messages of, of condemnation at times, and other times messages of forgiveness. Uh, these are going to be messages that tell of God's character, but also messages that reveal the quality of humans God is calling his people to be. And, and, and so if in the midst of of, of telling these stories that are, are based in history, if they happen to change a name here or there, so be it. Especially if it helps get the message across. So uh, here in this prophetic story, we find Ruth. An outsider from the hated land of Moab showing up in Israel and showing God's people how it is done. Right? So throughout her story, she exudes selflessness. And, and out of her selflessness, blessing will flow to others. And, and it all starts on that road back to Israel. Ruth and the other daughter-in-law, Orpah, uh, they're accompanying Naomi back to her home, and, and for her part, Naomi seems to be in, in kind of a depressed stupor after the tragedy of losing not only her husband, but, but also both of her sons. Uh, she feels like she's returning home empty, empty-handed, but, but, but then she seems to wake up a little, and reality sets in. And she's like, wait, wait, I changed my mind. Do not accompany me to Israel. Instead, return to your land and to, to your mother's home. My, my hope for you is that you find new husbands to love and care for you and to give you children. But, but, but they wouldn't listen. They're like, we won't leave you. We will go back with you. Like, like clearly they love her and, and Naomi, she's touched, but, but Naomi loves them too. And, and she wants what is best for them and insists that they go back to Moab. And she's like, no, you must return home. Coming with me is, is foolish. There, there's no happy future uh, for you if, if you come with me. And on, only misery. And, and at this, Orpah, her eyes filled with, with tears. She kisses Naomi goodbye and she departs. But then we're told Ruth would not leave. She clung to her and would not let go. And Naomi protested once more, please, Ruth, go back home. But Ruth responds, my home is with you wherever you go. And at this, Naomi gives up. And the two continue to Israel. Now, um... I, I feel for all three women in this story, especially Orpa, and I feel like I can can relate to her. Like she she tried to stay with Naomi, but her her mother in law kept insisting again and again that she leave, and you could argue that she was honoring her mother in law's wishes. So so I don't I don't blame Orpa for heading back home. I don't. Um, but apparently the prophetic authors do. Because the name Orpah means back of the neck. Back of the neck. Uh, as in, Naomi saw the back of her neck as Orpah walked away. Faced with the hard reality, Orpah chooses the option that seems best for her rather than what's best for Naomi. Ruth, however, right? friendship, companion. Ruth is being a friend. Ruth is acting righteously. She's clinging to the side of her mother-in-law despite the very likely disappointment and misery it will lead to. And as Naomi returns home, she is dejected and, and as she puts it, she's, she's empty. But she does not return alone. Ruth is her companion in her misery. Ruth acts selflessly, and Naomi experiences blessing. And so what, what's going on here, what's going on here with, with both the story itself and the names that are being used, you see, God is using these prophetic authors to, to like hold up a mirror to us and, and to ask us to look into it. And, and, and when we gaze into it, what do we see? Who do we see? Like, do, do we see Orpah? Do we see Ruth? Like, like, who are we, and what would we do in such a situation? Like, when tragedy strikes and hard times come, do we think first of ourselves, or do we put the well-being of others over our own? 
but the prophets, right, they're not done holding up the mirror. They're only getting started. And so the next chapter, it says Naomi and Ruth, they're in dire straits without husbands or sons. The reality back then, it's bleak. The reality back then is, is that two women, uh, these two women have an impossible task to provide for themselves. Uh, but Ruth, right, Ruth, a true friend and companion, she's willing to do what it takes to keep them fed and alive. And, and so she heads out to a field and, and begins the hard sacrificial work of gathering some of the field's leftovers after the harvesters have finished, right, just, just hoping to bring home enough for Naomi and herself. And, and, and she, she loves her mother-in-law so much that she works and works and works all day long out in the field, stopping for a brief rest only once. And so that mirror, it's asking us, you know, who, who among us would do the same, right? As we look in that mirror, do we see people who, facing scarcity and desperate circumstances, who, who remain focused on providing for not just ourselves, but also for others, right? And is the face looking back at us one that is willing to suffer so that another can prosper? But it is here where we also meet another selfless person. And so Boaz, Mr. Quickness, he, he turns out to be the owner of this particular field. And, and we also find out that he is a close relative of Ruth's dead husband. And real quick, we just need to stop here briefly and, and recognize that this story is occurring in a very different culture from ours. Uh, one in which Boaz is not just a close relative, but but he's also one of the designated guardian redeemers of Naomi's family, meaning that, that he is in a special position where he could marry Ruth. And, you know, there's more to it, but um, that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves because, you know, do we want Ruth to marry him? We're, we're not even sure if we like this guy yet. But as it turns out, we, we should like Boaz, or, or at least the biblical authors think so. Because right? Boaz, as we shall see again and again, he is a good man. He is a righteous man. He is a true Israelite who seeks to follow the commands and instructions of God. And one reason we know this right off the bat is because he instructs his workers to not harvest every single grain they can, but instead to intentionally leave some of the harvest behind so that widows, foreigners, and the poor can come behind and glean and be fed, just like Ruth is doing. And, and so what we see here is Boaz is putting people over prophets, and, and we're talking about the money kind of prophets, right? So the Bible kind of prophets want us to know that the righteous Boaz is the kind of person who puts people over the money kind of prophets. And again, the mirror, it, it raises up to our eye lines, and it's like people or prophets, right? People or savings accounts, people or wealth. We want to argue, oh, why, why do we have to choose? Can't we be generous and wealthy? Can't we care about people and the bottom line? And, and it's like, well, of course we can, but, but you see, one principle has to rule the day. As Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. And, and if we are trying to argue about that, then I think we already know what the mirror is saying. But, but there's more. Because as Boaz realizes who Ruth is and her selfless actions on behalf of Naomi, Mr. Quick, well, he responds immediately. His, his heart leads him instantly to begin looking after her. And, and as becomes clear in this story, as the story moves forward, Boaz does not want or expect or demand anything of Ruth. This is purely out of the goodness of his heart. I'm not saying he didn't find her attractive, but he's not expecting or demanding or assuming anything from her. He just is taking care of her. And, and it's like, how quick are we to bless others, right? Are we quick like Boaz? And, and how often when we do care for people, when we do do nice things, how often do we have ulterior motives, So Boaz promises Ruth safety and opportunity in his field, and, and after inviting her to join his workers for dinner, he continues his selfless ways by sending her home with even more food in addition to what he had gathered that day, in, in addition to what she had gathered that day, right? Uh, so, so he's like putting grain on, on top of grain, right? Blessings on top of blessings, uh, which raises an interesting question. You know, should there be a limit to our selflessness, 
right? Should, should there be a cap on the blessings we give? And, and that's one of those questions where, where we already know the right answer, but, but we don't like it much, right? Like it, it reminds me of uh, when Peter asked Jesus how many times he must forgive his brother, or, or uh, when that one teacher of the law asked Jesus about who his neighbor was. It's that desire for a limit, for an ex- for an excuse to be selfish and to not bless. Like, and it's like, where does that desire come from? You know, is is it about protecting and defending ourselves from being taken advantage of? Is it indignation at how the other person doesn't truly deserve it, like like we do? Uh, maybe we worked we worked hard for it, right? Or, or maybe is it just our our selfishness winning out, right? Ruling the day and and just having its way with us. And, and you know may, maybe it's a mix of all three, plus a lack of love. Right? As I was preparing for this, um, I, I wrote down, "Love is a wonderful cure for selfishness." And, and I'm thinking, you know, well, I love Jesus, I, I love my family, I try to love all people, but, but as I examine my actions and then look inward, I, I, I find the infection remains. And it's more than a little disappointing, because as I look in the mirror, like I, I should see Boaz, and I should see Ruth, and, and most of all, I should see Jesus, and Jesus, like he, he had no selfish bone in his body, right? No, no selfish thought in his head. He was just full of love, outflowing with love all the time. He had no cap limit on blessings or forgiveness or grace. Rather than protecting and defending himself, he willingly went to his death on our behalf and, and on behalf of the very hands that crucified him. And, and rather than indignation, right, his, his eyes were filled with tears of love. And through his selfless efforts, right, through Jesus' selfless efforts, Jesus delivered to us the blessing of salvation and the promise of eternal life, regardless of what we've done and, and who we are. Right? Like Jesus loves us and died for us, regardless of what kind of person currently stares back at us in that mirror. But at the same time, while, while Jesus did all of that for us, uh, while, you know, we're forgiven, right, th- that does not mean God is done trying to change us and fix us. You see, this, this prophetic mirror is not just meant to show us how selfish and sinful we can be and, and, and how in need of Jesus we are. You see, God also wants to use it to challenge us. And to change us. So let's bring this to an end. In the story, in this story we've been exploring about friendly Ruth and quick Boaz, the prophets, they want us to know what the community of God's people are supposed to be like and are supposed to act like. We are supposed to be selfless, right? resolute in our friendships, and, and quick in offering aid. And we're also called to care about names. Names are important. You see, when we turn people into numbers and statistics and labels and objects, we, we rob them of their dignity and, and humanity. But, but when we learn their names, and, and when we call them by their names, and, and we are made more aware of their humanity and their sacred worth and their dignity. And this is exactly what Jesus does for us, right? He knows our names. He loves us. And if we will embrace that being known, and if we will embrace that being loved, we will be changed. Because love is a wonderful cure for selfishness. And if we allow that transformation to take place, then out of our selflessness will flow blessing to others. As God's people, 
Will we seek to look like God? And as disciples of Jesus, will we follow his selfless ways? May we choose to allow God's goodness and Jesus' love to transform our selfless hearts. Amen.